go live. Hi and welcome to the NERPG 0.10 Alpha release live stream. In this live stream we will be demonstrating the new features in NERPG 0.10 Alpha including how to set up NERPG from the new GitHub repository which is now a complete Unity project. We'll also be demonstrating zero configuration mode, a new mode that allows you to use NERPG as just a basic character controller and doesn't require any configuration of the engine at all. It's perfect for basically testing out level design. We'll be demonstrating the new core game, and the core game is a simple game that demonstrates all the features of the engine in an easy to copy format, so you can use it for examples of how you wanna demonstrate or add features into your game. We'll be demonstrating the new character creator, which you can actually see me sort of playing with uh, right now, and we'll be uh, showing basically all the features of this new character creator, which allows you to customize your class um, specialization as well as your faction and preview basically any gear that is available for the characters as well. And we will also be demonstrating the new single unit prefab system, which is a system that is now in use that allows you to basically configure any character for the game with one single scriptable object instead of the previous um, like five scriptable objects and 20 mono behaviors. We'll be demonstrating how to add a new character to this character creator and we will be doing that with a giant rat boss. So that's gonna be pretty fun. And we will also be demonstrating the new simplified in vector um, camera setup, which removes a few steps from the in vector camera controller and makes it much uh, quicker to get yourself um, set up and working with your favorite in vector movement controller. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. We will start by demonstrating the new GitHub setup. And the new GitHub setup can be started by going to the GitHub repository. There is a link to it in the video description. You can also find links to it from nerpg.org. And the new GitHub URL has been changed from NERPG Alpha to NERPG Core to represent the fact that it is now a complete Unity project. If you look at the repository, you can see the installation instructions. So I'm now going to demonstrate how to install the um, NERPG Core from GitHub. The main difference between the NERPG Core and the NERPG Engine is that the NERPG Core doesn't contain a lot of the artwork and extra sound effects that the engine does so it's much smaller instead of 1.5 gigabytes it's about 280 megabytes when you download it. I'll be using git for windows and this includes git bash which is how I'm going to be cloning the repository and there will be a link for this in the video description as well um, or if you know you already know how to use git go ahead and just um, use your uh, favorite version of Git. So let's go ahead and open up uh, Git Bash and we'll just uh, maximize that and zoom in a little bit. Then I'll go to the directory where I store all of my Unity projects right here. And you can see my existing Unity projects. If you go to the NERPG core repository, you can click this little code button right here and HTTPS or SSH, it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna hit the copy button and back in git bash, I'm gonna type git clone and then I'm gonna click with my middle mouse button to copy that repository name, at which point it should start downloading the repository. It's about 75 meg zipped and about 280 megabytes unzipped. Now that we have unzipped it, there's a new directory called NERPG Core. We'll go ahead and we will open up our Unity Hub and click on Add. This requires Unity version 2019.4.20 F1. 
So we're going to click on add and it automatically brought it to the directory where I just cloned that git repository. I am going to click on the any RPG core folder there and click select folder and it properly detected the Unity version for that. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. It's going to ask me a couple questions about upgrading the asset database. Go ahead and just click yes on that option. It's going to import um, several of the scripts and then you'll see it go through and do a final importation run on the assets once that is complete. And then we will need to do a little bit of setup after that. The instructions are here in the readme file in the GitHub repository. The first thing we're going to need to do is basically configure um, Text Mesh Pro by importing the TMP essentials. Another message came up here. Uh, don't worry, I made a backup. Go ahead. This is a fresh project, right? So no worries about clicking that. And we'll see it. Um, just uh, finishing the import up here and in a couple seconds um, that'll complete and we'll be able to load the project. Um, the next thing we'll need to do after that is install the nav mesh components from GitHub and there's a link to that. So the thing to note here is that we want to install the 2019.3 um, branch of that. So you can see up here it says 2019.3 and what you can do is just click this download button here for code and click on download zip and then save it to your computer somewhere. In my case, I've already saved it uh, to this directory here. So what I'm going to do is just right click on the nav mesh components. I have a program called 7-zip installed, but if you uh, just have the default window zip, um, you should be able to just extract that as well. I think my window zip is actually uh, overwritten by 7-zip here. Um, so I'm just going to extract that to the nav mesh components folder. And the only thing we actually need out of this is inside of the assets folder, there's the folder here called nav mesh components. What the nav mesh components is for is in Unity, um, a nav mesh is normally baked into a level, but if we have moving bridges, we need to bake the nav mesh right onto the bridge object itself. And then that way, if you um, um, if the bridge moves, the navigation mesh will move with it because normally when you bake a navigation mesh, if you move a surface while the game is running, then that um, the navigation mesh uh, doesn't um, work properly. Okay, so now we have the project um, open and for some reason, Unity decided it was going to go ahead and remove my custom layout. Uh, that's kind of fun. Um, I'm just going to switch the layout here <laughs> really quickly to a layout that I am a little more comfortable with. There we go. I generally like to have the scene over here and same with the game view. I like to have it on maximize on play and somewhere here we should have a console window. There's the console. I'm just going to stick the console up at the top there. Perfect. Okay, there we go. So we see a whole pile of errors here um, and we don't want those. Um, I'm actually just going to close that asset store tab. Perfect. There's my project and then let's move my hierarchy in here. Okay, excellent. That is the view that I like. So I'm actually just going to save that. Um, Unity every once in a while just decides to, uh, to remove those views for you. Um, I'm also going to drag this down so I can see the folders here at the correct size. So now that we've imported this, we have a bunch of um, error messages here. So let's go ahead and fix those. To fix those error messages, we are going to have to uh, install a couple things. We're going to go to the window menu and text mesh pro and import TMP essential resources. And then when we get this little window here, uncheck that top box there because we have a customized version of this font. Uh, everything else is okay, so we'll go ahead and just click import. 
and then uh, text mesh pro will be in the project here. Then we are going to go to where I extracted those nav mesh components here. And we're just going to drag in the nav mesh components directory here. And now Unity should have a little spinning window there, and it should be recompiling. And once it's done recompiling, we will install the final dependency UMA. So we will go to the window and go to our package manager here. And I'm going to type in the word avatar, and that should bring up the UMA2 Unity Multipurpose Avatar. Let's go ahead and import that. Um, actually, I'm just going to wait one second. There. Um, the version for this is 2.10.1. You'll notice when I first opened it, it was the latest version 2.11. I haven't tested it with 2.11, so um, try this uh, 2.10.1 uh, for now. It should be pretty much guaranteed to work. We'll go ahead and we'll just click import here. And it's going to go ahead and decompress uh, the package. And after a second, it will give us the option of what we want to import. And we're just going to go ahead and import the entire package here. And that looks good. So we'll just import that. While it's importing, I'm just going to note um, some differences between the GitHub installation and the Unity package installation. Um, any RPG is also available as a Unity package, which you can pick up from anyrpg.org slash downloads. And the version that we're using for this demo is actually 0.10.1 alpha. There were a few bugs in the base version of 10 alpha, so definitely be using the latest version of 0 0.10 if you're going to be following along with this demo and tutorial. Um, when we create a new project in Unity by default, let's just take a look at what that looks like, and I'm just going to choose 2019.4.20, and I'm just going to accept the default new Unity project and hit create. What you'll see is that this new Unity project is actually using the .NET standard 2.0 API by default. And we don't want that. We actually want the latest one. So when this new project loads, I'll show you how to see what version of the .NET API you're using. Let's go ahead and go to the Edit menu and go to Project Settings. Click on Player scroll down a little bit and here you'll see API compatibility level .NET standard 2.0. Any RPG requires .4.x so if you are installing the GitHub version you don't have to worry about this it's done automatically. Um, it's also done automatically if you install the Unity package but it's a little out of order. If you click this yourself now and manually set it to .NET 4.x and restart your project before importing the Unity package, you won't see any errors. If you don't do that, what you'll see is an error similar, or two of them actually, um, like this. And it says that uh, the type or namespace dynamic method couldn't be found. And this is part of um, what we use to hook into Invector. You may also see all these like script errors missing um, like this as well. And if you, it's a little confusing because if you go to the edit um, project settings and go to the player, you can see that the .NET version's already been upgraded to 4.x. But what we need to do is actually close this down and then reopen the project. And after the restart, then Unity will go ahead and detect um, that namespace. For some reason, after you upgrade the .NET version, that namespace doesn't become available until you've actually restarted the project. So while this is restarting, we're going to go back to the GitHub version here. Um, we can see that UMA is installed now. And if we open this up a little further, we can see that all of our error messages have gone away. And we can actually start demoing some of the new features that are available in the NERPG core version. So let's start with a really cool and fun feature. And this is zero configuration mode. I really like zero configuration mode because you can now basically just use NERPG as kind of like a 
character controller. So to do that, what we're going to do is sort of we've got a scenario here. And let's say you're testing out some new levels from the Unity Asset Store. Um, and you just want to see, you know, like how big are the trees in this level? What does it feel like to run around in it? You know, should I, should I use this in my game? And you don't want to go through all the trouble of like actually adding it to your game uh, just to do that test. So what we're going to do is uh, make sure we have our NERPG core project open. We're going to go ahead and click open in Unity and that's going to open up our package manager and there's the environment pack. I'm now going to click on the import button and this is a really nice small project so it's going to just import pretty quickly here. It takes about 20 seconds or so. All right, and now it's imported. So if we go into this project and we take a look and we can find some scenes here, like this um, bright day scene. If I click on the scene tab here, we can see, hey, this looks pretty cool, you know? So let's go run around inside this using zero configuration mode. I'm gonna middle click on the ground right here. This is where I want my character to spawn. And in my project, I'm going to search for the default spawn location prefab, and I'm just going to pull that in. And this basically contains a tag default spawn location that tells our character where to spawn. Um, I'm just going to spin this around, hitting the E key, and then holding down control and spinning that 90 degrees, then hitting W, and you can see my character will be facing forward in the direction of the blue arrow. Next, I'm going to disable the main camera because NERPG has its own camera. And in my project, I'm going to search for the game manager. I'm going to pull the game manager into this scene. And now all I have to do is press play. And let me just turn up the volume a little bit here. There we go. I think you can probably hear the footsteps now. Um, so basically, there I am with um, just our simple box man, and I can run around the level. And this is a great level because all the trees already have colliders on them. Uh, the ground has colliders on it and my character can just uh, sort of run around here. Um, there's no spells or abilities, no attacks, no enemies, you know, and I can't interact with anything. Um, also, uh, there's no bags, so if I try to open a bag, you don't have any bags equipped. But basically, if you just want to, you know, get a quick feel for what's a place look like, um, what's it feel like to run around in it, um, or test out your level design, maybe you're designing a level, then this uh, zero configuration mode um, could probably help you out. Now, let's look at another example of zero configuration mode. So what I'm going to do is there's another pack here on the asset store, this Polypack Lite. And um, it requires a little bit more configuration, so this is why I just wanted to demo this pack as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and click import on that. And this is about 2 megs, so it's nice and quick um, to, uh, to actually test here. Okay, perfect. It is downloaded, so now I'm going to go open that pack, and we're going to go click on scene and we're going to open the scene. I'm not going to bother saving my other scene because this was just sort of a, a demo. And here's the scene, you know, it's, an, it's a nice little village. This is pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is I'll just have my character spawn in the middle right here. So once again, I'll find the default spawn location. I'll just pull that in. Now, one thing to note, if you don't put the default spawn location in, your character will just spawn at vector 3.0. And with a lot of maps, vector 3.0 is like off to a corner somewhere. So you just end up like falling forever. So make sure that you, um, that you put that default spawn location in there. Um, next, once again, I'm going to grab the game manager and I'm just going to pull it into the scene here and um, disable the main camera as well. And I'm gonna play and you'll see something happen. My character is basically just gonna fall through the map pretty much right away um, and just start falling. So there's a good reason why that happened. That first level that we um, loaded up, this one right here, it had a terrain and that terrain had a collider on it, but this terrain doesn't have any colliders on them. So we can fix that basically by, you can see all the terrain has a mesh renderer. 
we just select everything under terrain here and go add component and mesh collider and now if we press play when our character starts he's not going to fall through the map here and this is because you can see basically that this is a kit and it's just made of like a bunch of different tiles of terrain um, you can see there's no colliders on the buildings as well um, so this is really fun for exploring things maybe maybe you know you, you download something and you think the buildings might have interiors you run around and it's just like oh these don't have interiors you know i'm not going to use that in my project or whatever so that is zero configuration mode. Um, I hope you find that useful. It's uh, been a long time coming and I'm really excited to finally have that feature um, available to use. Let's go ahead next and look at another feature that is available. Um, we're still in the NERPG core game from GitHub here. And this core game, um, or yeah, the core game, or the NERPG core includes something called the core game. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. We're not going to bother to save this. Um, just look for the core game scene. And the core game is basically just a super, super simple game um, with not really any artwork that allows you to test out every feature of the engine um, in a simple way. Previously, you could see all the features of the engine in the Lost Soul game that was available um, as part of the Unity package, but the Lost Soul game was a really complex example and it was hard to, to know where to look for the examples. Um, in the core game, as you'll see here, the examples are very easy to find and very sort of straightforward. So the core game by default includes, includes two types of characters. We have the Uma character and Boxman. And if we're looking at Boxman and we go to Appearance, you can see he's got no Appearance options, but if we go to the default Uma player and click on the Appearance tab, now we've actually got the full character creator available to us. So let's go ahead and just give this guy, you know, a little bit of, um, of an appearance here. And give him a devilish goatee, maybe make his hair sort of darker, give him a little bit of a tan, and it uh, looks pretty good. So call this guy uh, Mr. Handsome. All right, so let's start the game uh, with Mr. Handsome. Um, he currently doesn't have any faction class or specialization, and that's kind of intentional here uh, because we can basically test all that stuff out with uh, the core game and choose those things ourselves. So looking around, what we can see is a couple of combat arenas um, behind, as well as some triggers for the doors, and I will demonstrate those later. And basically a bunch of characters which demonstrate pretty much almost every interactable that is available in the game. Interactables are, are things that you can interact with, and they're all named pretty easily, um, recognizable, so you know, play music, you can play music with this guy, that's your bank, etc. Um, over to the right hand side, we have um, gathering and crafting, and I'll be demonstrating that in a bit. There's a dungeon here we can go to. In the back, there are some examples of different patrol guys you can see running around. And then we have some environmental effect areas over to the right hand side. So let's get started by changing our class. Um, actually, first I'll demonstrate the dragon mount. The dragon mount is included by default. So you can just ride a dragon out of the box. Um, in addition, if we hop off of our dragon here, um, everyone can teleport to the dungeon by default as well. So let's go ahead and just click that teleport spell. And we have teleported into a dungeon where there's a boss arena. You can see the boss has four times as much health as I do. And then there's some minion arenas uh, with a moving bridge, which we will demonstrate later as well. You can demonstrate the open and close door functionality right here by clicking on the door and the portal functionality by wandering through the portal and going back to the level. And here you can see we're back at the start um, as well. If we open that, we can just walk to the dungeon manually as well. We don't necessarily have to teleport there. Let's go ahead and test out some of these interactables. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the vendor and you can see that we've got examples of bags here. So I have a backpack by default. Um, I don't have any money by default, but this is a currency item. It gives you an item that gains currency and its price is free. So I can just keep on clicking that and you know now I've got 100 gold, which is fantastic. I can buy anything I want. So we can buy some bags here, equip them, 
Now we've got an extra bag, we can buy health potions and some bread and some scrolls and a quest start item. And we can test out all that different functionality. These are different types of basically consumables here. Um, then if we wanted, uh, we have some regular quality accessories and some better quality accessories. And you can see these ones actually are green colored and give you extra stats. Um, as well, we have gear and weapons. And so I'm gonna turn my guy into a wizard. So I'm just gonna buy the best staff in the game. It's uh, purple, it's pretty epic looking there. And then I'm gonna go buy him some cloth armor. So I will get the better cloth armor and I'll just load him up with basically all of the cloth gear. Now in order to equip this stuff, I'm actually gonna need to change the class. So I will head over, um, I'll choose a faction. I'm gonna go with the uh, red faction. And these guys allow you to sh see what it's like to basically just change to a single faction. Or in this case, this change faction, all guy has all factions available on him. And now we can choose change class all, which allows you to change all three of them, or a demonstration of how to just change an individual class, which will just pop right into the menu here. Um, I'm gonna change to the magic class, and this shows me the abilities and traits I'm gonna learn. And I wanna become a wizard, so you can see that I have three specializations available, or two of them actually, healer and wizard in uh, this row. And I'm gonna change to the wizard specialization and learn some pretty cool spells. Now that I'm a wizard, I can go ahead and equip the gear. The gear is be uh, Uma gear, and because my character is an Uma character, um, you can see that basically he put on all the Uma gear. If he was a box man, he wouldn't have equipped that. If I click on the quest start item, I can complete a quest and gain some crafting items. And I actually have to choose one of them. And then if I click on the scroll here, I can get a stamina buff. Uh, if I click on the bread here, I can basically eat it. And this is demonstrating the edible uh, object functionality. And similarly, um, if I need to recover some health, I can basically drink a potion. And you can see that sort of disappears over time as well. Um, next up, now that my character is wearing this staff, he has a one piece set bonus, which doubles his movement speed so he can run around a lot faster. We can go ahead and play music here if we want. We can go to the bank and we can stop the music. We can change our character's name, so um, he is no longer naked because he has some clothes on. So we can also see examples of dialogues um, and we can change our character's appearance if we want. Maybe we want to give him an even darker tan, so we'll make his skin super dark and save that. And now you can see that he is very much darker now. Um, we can go to the skill trainer here and we can learn all of the skills in the game and you can see some of the new effects. And now suddenly we have some trees available to us and so we can go over here and harvest some uh, white spheres or you know some green boxes and chop down these green boxes. And then you can use these to craft. Um, so basically uh, green boxes and green spheres will make high quality items, white boxes and white spheres will make lower quality. Um, similarly, there is a item pickup over here. This doesn't require any gathering skills. You can just go ahead and pick up the sword off the table. And then let's say I wanted to craft some equipment here. Then let's say I wanted to make a cape. I could, or a necklace because I've got the ingredients. I can hit craft and then you can see I pull out a green box and then start smacking away with my hammer. Let's go ahead and take a look at the environment areas. We have environmental areas over here. If I stand in the poison, I get a poison debuff on me that'll slowly tick over time. And if I go in the water, you can hear splashing footsteps. If I go stand in the fire, this is basically just only gonna burn while I'm in there. It doesn't leave any sort of dot. This loop patrol here guy, guy over here is basically patrolling between four different points and he'll just keep on patrolling over and over forever. This random patrol guy here will wander five to 10 meters away from his pole and stop. This despawn patrol will start at the one end of this box here, move over to the red pole and then disappear. 
And with the Save Position Patrol, he actually demonstrates a number of things, including behaviors which can trigger patrols. So I can tell him, go to the red pole, and he will go ahead and wander over to the red pole. And he will also save his position. So if I was to, for example, save the game right now, and then go to the main menu and reload it, he would be at the red pole instead of the usual starting spot at the green pole. Let's go take a look um, at the arenas, and let's see if I missed any of these interactables here. Um, there's a quest guy here as well, so you can basically see all sorts of different quests, dialogue quests, um, kill things quests, use interactable, visit zone quests. Um, so there's examples of all the different types of quests that you can do, as well as a cutscene, which will load another scene. And it has basically one of each um, class type and the two different factions. So you can sort of watch this cutscene and see um, what each of the different uh, abilities the guys have. You can see them shooting lightning bolts and like, charming each other and tornadoes flying around there. You might see some other things here. You can see that the uh, timeline is uh, changing the skybox in the background. So it's a great example um, of what can be accomplished with a cutscene. Over here we can spawn characters, um, so let's go ahead and click on spawn character and I'll just spawn a blue melee guy. You can see this new sort of glow effect on his hand here and then I can demonstrate some of my wizard spells that are built into the game here. So let's start with a life drain. I can drain his life and actually I killed him pretty quick so maybe I should uh, spawn a blue boss here who's going to be a little bit tougher. Um, if I click on the blue melee, I can revive an enemy here. So basically, I use this sort of necromancy, and you can see he gets like these little hearts above his head, and now he is basically going to become my pet. The boss is going to attack him, um, so why don't I cast an ice projectile at the boss? And then I can cast ice shards at him, and do this sort of blizzard effect, and then I can also put a blizzard on the ground. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll cast a blizzard here. Uh, try it again. Keeps on blowing me up here. Um, I can also demonstrate the bridge here. We can click on this button and this bridge is going to basically move up and down and the boss um, and the melee guy can blow me up with a laser or they can choose to come walk on the bridge if they really feel like it. Um, I can also I'm going to do the blizzard here, and he's going to run into the blizzard. There we go. Okay, there you go. Blizzard, and he's gone. You can also put, um, like, a meteor shower on the ground, um, as well as a ring of fire on the ground, and basically anybody that sort of walks into that ring of fire is just going to take fire damage. Um, there's some other cool things here as well. Let's, uh, let's just take a look at the tornadoes. We'll spawn a boss again over here, and uh, I'll send a tornado at him. Let I won't, because he's just going to try to zap me again. All right, there we go. Now, the tornado is basically going to head towards the boss, and when it hits him, it's going to, like, levitate him in the air, and then he won't be able to take any action at all. Um, we also have a life exchange, so I can basically, like, burn my life in order to gain mana. So you can see there's a considerable amount of different sorts of abilities um, that you can use in here um, to demonstrate the, uh, the features of the engine. Now, let's go ahead and look at the trigger arena. If I click this door here, it's going to activate a little cutscene. It's also going to move that movable object down. You can see in the cutscene, the boss is still attacking me there. Uh, let's just kill him really quick with ice shards. This is going to freeze him um, in a way that makes it so he can't attack. This ability is like super, super overpowered. Um, next up, when we walk into this trigger arena here, then you'll actually see it trigger a spawn and there's a red boss. Now, of course, I'm of the red faction, so he is friendly to me. Let's go ahead and move over to the other end of uh, the arenas here, and we see a blue trigger arena, and the way that this one works is um, essentially if both of these objects here, these pressure switches, have blocks on them, then the door is going to open. And this demonstrates both um, weighted pressure switches as well as the idea of um, um, 
control gates basically which is it's almost like a logic gate but essentially um, you can require multiple inputs to need to be activated at the same time and when they all are then it'll trigger something like this door here which now opens up the blue trigger arena and then of course I can get a blue boss there and let's just stick a ring of fire on the ground and have some fun with him we'll set him on fire maybe if he moves closer to us he'll get on fire there we go, now you can see he's burning, and of course he's going to zap us, so I'll just kill him real quick here. My favorite ability, Ice Shards. Okay, that is pretty much um, everything that you can do inside of the core game. So this is really useful for developers, because developers can now... Um, use the core game to test out their features and because it's available on github you can just um, basically copy or I mean um, fork the repository clone it to your um, local machine write your feature test your feature on the core game and then um, and then make your pull request uh, the core game is also really useful if you want to figure out how to put certain mechanics in your game. You can see the uh, the, the moving nav mesh isn't perfect there. Um, okay, let's go ahead and um, demo the next part of this, which is the character creator. For this, I am going to head over to a different project. Uh, the any RPG demo, which is using the full Unity package. Up until now, I was just demoing the GitHub project. And I'm going to demonstrate all of the interesting features in a Lost Soul example game manager here. Um, for the a Lost Soul example game, if you click the Use New Game window, instead of just launching directly into the game, you will now have the ability to choose your faction and your class. So let's go ahead and demo that. When we click New Game here, we can set our player name and choose our character class. Um, in this case, what I am going to do is I'm going to choose the beasts and I'm going to choose the cute fluffy bunny because he has some pretty good animations. Um, now basically every um, unit in the game can be playable. You're basically no longer limited to just your main character. What we can see if we go to the details tab here is our hero. I am furry is a beast he is a channeler and he is an elementalist so when we click on start the game we have set his name and we can see all these properties what that means is that he will get all of the abilities that belong to the channeler class so our bunny here can perform a mana pool to get his mana back and if there was elementals around he could bind the elementals because he's also an elementalist um, you can see we can run around, uh, we can jump, and basically do everything that we would expect to. We've got a mana bar. Um, our bunny isn't actually carrying any equipment right now because um, bunnies can't wear cloth armor. It's not available to the unit type of beast. Um, but, you know, if we were a humanoid character, then he, we would actually have armor on as well. And I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Um, because all characters basically get the attack, I can head over here and, you know, aggro this squirrel. And then my auto attack goes on and I'll start trying to bite him. But the squirrel's a fighter and I'm a caster with no spells right now. Um, so, you know, the squirrel's going to basically kill my bunny pretty quickly. And we can even go play the squirrel if we wanted as well. Let's go ahead and jump back to the main menu and demonstrate another interesting feature about the new character creator. Um, this time I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose the Sunsworn. And if we go to the uh, character menu here, then 
basically the faction filters the available character models. So as the Sunsworn, I can play Danica Light Quiver, I can play Master Impassive, I can be the father of roosters or the mother of chickens or the seamstress or the master alchemist or the warrior trainer. I'm gonna choose the seamstress here. Um, we're gonna go back and choose her character class as fighter. There's no specialization available, so that option sort of disappears there. And if we go back to the details page here, we can see we are now a ninja granny. And ninja granny has some nice looking uh, ninja claws there. Let's go ahead and start the game as ninja granny. Because she is part of the Sunsworn faction, she's automatically gonna start in the Sunsworn starting area which is the Sun Temple, um, as opposed to that um, bunny who started over in Light Free Outpost because that's um, basically the beast's um, home starting faction. So now we can basically live out our dreams of um, being a ninja granny and uh, you know, just wreaking havoc uh, with our ninja claws because we're part of the Sunsworn faction. We get this Fist of Light buff as well as the Warming Ray ability. And we also have Jab, and attack and we've got an energy bar. The reason that you can put um, any weapon basically also on any character in the game, um, actually, and you can see here because Ninja Granny isn't an Uma character, she has the leather gloves, but you're not actually seeing them on her character because she's just using like a standard mechanism model, so it won't try to change the appearance there. Um, the reason that we can put these on the character is because of a new feature basically called weapon harnesses and I will demonstrate how weapon harnesses work because they are super useful um, and they're just a really really easy way to um, add um, mount points for weapons to your characters. So let's go ahead and look at the old lady model that's uh, our ninja granny there. We'll go into the scene view here and here she is in her default pose. And you can see we have a couple of um, items here. So I'm gonna hold down Alt to just open this whole thing up here and check all those buttons. Uh, similarly, gonna hold down Alt to open up the spine attachments and make all those active. And then we also have some shield attachments here we can open up as well as some hand attachments that we can go ahead and enable. They're all hidden by default here, and the right hand attachments. Okay, so basically there are five weapon harnesses um, that come with the engine. If we just hit select here, you can see them. They're under a directory called template prefab attachments, and there's all sorts of them. Um, we have the right hand attachment, the left hand attachment, the shield attachment, the hip attachment, and the spine attachment. So the right and left hand attachments just have swords in them, so you can basically see what a sword will look like on this character. Um, and it basically contains uh, this attachment and this handle, and the game will automatically look for these things and mount um, the weapon to the correct attachment based on its type. So if we look, for example, at the shield attachment, the shields will go there. Um, anything that's in your left hand will go to this left hand attachment. Anything in the right hand will go to the right hand attachment. And um, you can see on the spine, we have attachments for staffs and uh, shields and swords and quivers and axes and stuff. Um, and then on the hip attachments, we have um, Scrolling up even further here, you can see that we have uh, attachments for swords uh, and like uh, fist weapons and maces and stuff like that. And so basically by just um, pulling one of these um, harnesses here, like this hip attachment onto your character and just sort of aligning it correctly, then you don't have to worry about manually placing any weapons when they sheath. They'll just go in the correct spot on this harness. And that is what makes it so that in our character creator, we can equip any weapon in the game on any character by only pulling five pretty simple prefabs onto the character. Um, let's demonstrate kind of another fun thing that we can do with our character creator. The dragon that you saw me riding around earlier as a mount, um, because we're using a new single unit prefab system, and I will demonstrate that prefab system in a little bit, um, let's go ahead and create a new game. And anything that you can use as a 
character you can also use as a mount. So let's become an elemental and I'll go to the character and choose the red dragon and go ahead and start the game. And you can see that because um, my, oh, actually, let's cancel this cutscene. The elementals are having their starting zone as this cave and I'm friendly with the rock golems, but there are some undead outside that I can go and harass. So let's go ahead and harass some undead outside here. You can see that as I wander around, I have these giant footsteps and this is the exact same unit prefab as the mount. Um, it's precisely the same unit, but with a new prefab system, uh, the engine will basically just switch this uh, dragon between mount mode and um, you can play it as a character mode automatically. When this guy gets close to us, we can attack him normally um, using the regular attack animations, or I can hit this red dragon's breath and just like fry him with fire, pretty much. Uh, my dragon doesn't come with a backpack, so the only thing I can loot is the copper. I can't loot anything else because I have no inventory slots. But, you know, it's kind of fun to um, just run around frying things uh, as a dragon, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, you can basically, with this new um, unit prefab system, play any character you want, whether it's humanoid or not. Um, let's go ahead and demonstrate how easy it is to add a new character by adding a rat. I have this really cool evil giant rat here um, that I got off of open game art and the rat model is in the engine but it's not really configured yet so I will demonstrate live how we could actually play this rat. Now in the engine if we go to the beast you'll see we do have one rat already and that rat is um, kind of looks a little bit more like a teddy bear. So let's go ahead to the beasts faction and go to our character and and go down and he's called rat small but he's not a very great looking rat not nearly as cool as our evil giant rat there so let's go ahead and make the evil giant rat a playable character to do that i am going to search for rat and look for an fbx file um, in this case i think it's the top one because this rat comes with like an extra platform underneath him so this is going to be a perfect example of how we can sort of clean things up a little bit here. So we have this FBX folder here and we've got the rat. Um, the first thing we need to do is go to rig and make sure it's got an avatar that's going to be necessary. So we'll just choose create from this model and hit apply. Um, I'm just going to right click to pop this uh, preview out here so you can see um, the rat basically is on this plane so we're going to need to clean this up a little bit and you know that's pretty common to occasionally find um, stuff that has these sorts of issues. So we've created an avatar for it, so that's great. I'm just going to pull the rat into my scene here, and then I, I'm going to call him Boss Rat Model, and then I'm just going to drag that out into the directory and choose Original Prefab, and now I have a model that I can go clean up a little bit. So we have two planes here. Uh, this first plane is basically some grass. We don't really need the grass. And we have the second plane, which is underneath him, and we don't need that either, so we can just delete that, and everything else in here looks okay. One thing to note here, um, because this came, I think, originally from like a Blender file or something, um, its scale is going to be set to 100 times, and this is going to be important later on. Um, one thing that I'm going to do right now is just look for the head bone, um, because we'll need the head bone to set the unit frame up, so if we look this is his head bone it's called head one the thing at the bottom called head isn't the bone it's just like um uh sitting at zero 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 uh it's basically a skin mesh renderer um so what we want is the actual head bone which is called head space one with a capital h and that's important because we're going to be referencing that later um i'm going to go ahead and just click save and now let's go make um, the unit prefab for this. So I'm going to look for rat small because that's um, the other existing rat. And I basically just want to copy the other existing rat. If you weren't doing this um, by copying something, you would just um, right click in your project and choose 
create uh, an ERPG and then look at unit profile here and create a new one. Um, but in this case, we're just going to copy an existing one because it's basically almost exactly what we need. So I'm going to select that and control D to duplicate it. And I'm going to call this the boss rat unit. We'll change the name here to boss rat and big evil boss do that. Um, we'll not use a regional description on this. Um, what that means is basically instead of looking for an icon or description based on what region or language you're using, we're just going to hard code this to English pretty much. And I'm going to type in rat and just choose like a nice evil rat icon there to use for the, um, the picture for this guy. I'm not going to use an automatic prefab profile. I'm going to use the new unit prefab props and make sure that the inline props is checked. What happens here is for our prefab profile, which basically references the game objects that make this rat up, um, you can either use a shared prefab profile, like if you're going to have lots of different types of rats sharing the model, or you can just check this inline prefab props box and just fold that out there and set everything here. So for the unit prefab, this is why it's now called the single unit prefab system. We're going to search for the default character unit dot prefab. And all characters are now basically based on this. So the only thing that we need to do is just pull in our boss rat model into the model prefab. And that is how easy it is to basically configure the actual physical look of the character. Because this rat isn't humanoid, we can't use humanoid animations. We're going to have to use inline animation props. Uh, you can also use a shared animation props if you want, but we'll use the inline ones. Um, and then we need to actually assign the animations from this character. So I happen to know that the attack clips that I'm going to want to use are attack clip 0. We'll pull that into there. We'll set a second one and we'll use attack clip two. Zero is like a bite and two is a claw and I check these out in advance. Um, we'll want to set the idle, jump, fall, land, move forward and move forward fast. That's sort of the minimum basically that we'll want. So what we'll do is we'll use idle zero zero one. I know that's a good one to use. Um, when he jumps, he doesn't have jump animations. So we are just going to use the running animations. So he'll just sort of keep running in midair. Um, I'm doing this because otherwise, basically, he'll just freeze up. Um, and that doesn't look very good. Um, we'll choose walk for the move forward clip. And then we'll choose run for the move forward fast clip. And now we have a rat that can basically do everything except for die. So I need to assign him a death clip. Let's go ahead and put that down there, armature die. And I'm going to choose rotate model. This is because he doesn't have strafe animations. Um, so what we want is basically when he turns left, we don't want him to try to strafe. Um, we want him to actually turn his model and run to the left. I'm also going to choose full combat mirror because he doesn't have separate um, combat animations. So this will just mirror whatever his non-combat animations are whenever he is in combat as well. And that is pretty much everything um, that we need. Uh, we do need to set up his unit nameplate. I happen to know that this rat is like four meters long. Um, so when we're looking at him on the load game screen, we're going to be looking at him from four meters away. So we're not like basically right up his nose. Um, we're going to use the head one bone for the unit frame. That's the little green unit frame in the top of the screen there. And his head is actually Y forward. Normally they're Z forward. Um, and because he is 100 times bigger, we are going to set this to 0 0.015. And that will basically make it what would have been like a meter in front of his head, which is somewhere around here, uh, the base of his head. Um, but because he's 100 times bigger, it's not going to be a centimeter, it'll be like a meter. So our camera looking at him is going to be about where my mouse is right now. Um, that is pretty much it. Nothing else that we really need to do there other um, than, like, we don't need an attachment profile because he's a rat. He's not actually going to be using anything. Um, the one thing that we do need to do is we need to go to the Beasts faction. And under Character Creator Profile Names, we'll just add a tenth one there and we'll make boss rat an option. Um, we do actually one thing that we need to do is we need to make these attacks work. So let's go into the animation and just set up the attacks. 
First, we want his run to loop time and loop pose. We want his walk to loop time and loop pose. And we want his idle 001 to loop time and loop pose. Otherwise, he'll just complete one loop of the idle and then suddenly freeze up. We'll go ahead and hit apply on that. And next, we want to make his attack so that they will actually hit. And I'll show you how to do that. We're going to open up the events tab here. We're going to move the animation forward until like sort of the bite. So there you see his teeth go down right about here. And at that point, we're going to click this uh, little marker there and put the word hit. And that will make um, a hit event, which will actually cause the damage to happen. Similarly, for attack 002, we want to move that forward until the claw strikes, which is right about there. And then we'll add a hit event as well. And hit apply. And now the attacks will actually be able to do damage. And if I'm not mistaken, that is everything that we need to do. So let's go ahead and load up the game. And if we attempt to start a game with the Beasts faction... And choose character, we should see Boss Rat at the bottom there. We are about the right distance away from him. He is pretty big. You can't really tell from here, but he's like four meters long. And if we go to the details, I am Teb Boss. And we'll go ahead and start our game. He's also a channeler, just like the little bunny was. And here he is, the boss rat. So you can see him running, he's properly turning, and you know, he doesn't have jump animation, so he just sort of keeps on trying to run in, in midair. Uh, you know, he can cast spells. He doesn't have any casting animations, so it's just like sort of freezing up right now. Um, but you could set anything you want, basically, as his casting animation. You can see that his idle works, and then if we head over down here, and get close enough to the squirrel and aggro the squirrel and start attacking. You can see he is doing the bite um, and every once in a while he will randomly uh, swing at him instead of doing a bite. So that's how easy it is using the new single unit prefab system. All we had to do was basically um, make a reference to the character model and then just set up one single scriptable object and now um, well, two actually, technically, we had to add the faction as well. But basically, to actually set up the character, one scriptable object, and our rat was playable. Next up, we are going to show the new simplified Invector camera setup. So for this, um, we'll be using the Invector Basic Locomotion Controller. You'll need um, one of the paid versions. The free version isn't uh, quite working yet, so it's uh, still the paid versions of Invector controllers only at this point. Um, the third-person controller shooter template from the Asset Store, I'll link to that, is one that will work. Same with the third-person controller melee combat template or the third-person controller basic locomotion template, uh, the paid version, not the free version. Um, the reason either both of these will work is because they both actually include the basic controller template, and that's actually really the only one that we're going to be using anyway. Um, once you've um, downloaded that package, you will need to import it into your Unity project. So what I'm going to do is go find the directory where I stored the Invector third-person uh, shooter template. And this is a uh, version 2.5. Um, the latest version, I think, is 2.5.6. And from what I've heard, it's still working. Um, let me know if it doesn't. And it's just uh, decompressing right now. And in a second, we will get an option perfect uh, uh, for what we're going to install. Now, it's going to give you a warning. Go ahead and click Import, but we're not actually going to overwrite the project settings. Um, any RPG is already designed with the right settings for Invector. So we're going to click the Skip button right here. Very important. Next. Um, Uncheck Item Manager, uncheck Melee Combat, uncheck Shooter, and 
the most important of all, uncheck project settings. Project settings are already perfect, so we're only importing the basic locomotion controller. Let's go ahead and import that. And because it's just the basic locomotion controller, then it's going to be a pretty quick import. If you want um, text instructions on how to set up the Invector controller, you can find them at wiki.nerpg.org and just click on Invector controller setup. And we'll basically just be sort of walking through the instructions that are on this page. There's screenshots for everything you need to do, as well as differences between different NERPG versions highlighted, um, as this process basically gets simpler and simpler over time. Um, so if you just need a quick reference, you don't necessarily have to come back uh, to the video and watch it. You can always um, just look up the text reference there. Now that we have the Invector controller, um, we need to make a new folder just to store some prefabs we need to create to get the Invector controller to, um, to work properly and integrate. So I'm just going to call this Invector Game right here. And the first thing we're going to do is open up the Invector controller basic locomotion and we want to load up the demo scenes folder here open the Invector basic locomotion. I'm just going to close my NERPG folder just to clean this up a bit. And we want to grab this third person camera here and drag it into our Invector game folder and just make a prefab out of it. Um, we can leave that scene now. So let's go back to the Lost Soul example game because that's the game I'm going to be demoing this with. So we'll load up the Lost Soul example game. Click on Don't Save here. And now we want to look for the UMA Invector player unit template. This is part of the NERPG engine. It's also under the templates uh, directory. And we'll just pull that into the scene. Um, in the next version, you will be able to skip this step. But for now, because I'm still on UMA 2.10, uh, we will need to go to the UMA menu and click on Bone Builder with this thing selected and click on Generate Bones. And now you can see we've got a bone hierarchy inside of there. Um, the Invector controller requires a bone hierarchy. So now we can go to the Invector controller under Basic Locomotion and choose Create Basic Controller. And we'll go ahead and just click on Create and we have this new object right there. We're going to make a prefab out of that and pull it into our project. So just pull that into the Invector game folder. And now we can delete everything except for the Lost Soul Game Manager and the UMA DCS. Next, we're going to configure each of these prefabs we made to actually work with any RPG. So on the third person camera, we're going to select default under the state and we are going to check the box use zoom and this will allow us to zoom in and out using our mouse wheel which is a pretty convenient feature the default mouse sensitivity is extremely low in my opinion so i'm going to change those two values from 3 to 10 on the mouse sensitivity x and the mouse sensitivity y next i'm going to go to the v basic controller which is um, the basically character unit that now has the Invector components added. I'm going to open up Advanced Options under Dynamic Character Avatar, and I'm going to set the Animation Controller to the Invector at Basic Locomotion Controller. I'm going to click on Open Properties on the Third Person Controller, and on the Health, which is the default, I'm going to check Is Immortal. Any RPG is handling the health, so we don't want Invector to kill our player um, when he basically drops from too high of a height because um, any RPG doesn't recognize the Invector death. It only recognizes its own death currently. We're going to go to the Debug tab and we're going to uncheck Use Instance um, just because um, this is necessary because we can have multiple characters uh, in the scene at the same time. And in the Input Manager, 
we're going to check unlock cursor on start and show cursor on start. By default, the cursor is hidden within vector, but because we have action bars at, our, at the bottom of our screen, we want that cursor to be showing. Under camera settings, we're going to check lock camera input, and that is necessary because otherwise when we move our mouse down to the action bars, the character's uh, camera view will wildly swing around, so we want to require the character or the player to click left or right mouse button in order to swing the camera around so that the mouse just remains free to click on action bars. That's, I think that's it for um, the actual configuration of those objects. Now we need to actually configure our game to use those new objects. So going to the Lost Soul example game manager, I'm going to uncheck the use new game window. The Invector controllers at this point are going to work best if you're only starting the game with the same unit every time. Um, if you want your player to be able to choose a bunch of different characters, you'd need every character to be configured as one of these Invector units. Under the character creator profile names, um, the one we'll be using is Uma body for this example. You can use any unit profile you want, just like the rat unit profile that I showed you in the last um, example. For our use case in this game, you start with a different player than is in the character creator so that you can start as a soul. So to make sure you start the game with the right player, I'm just going to make sure they're both Uma body, and then I'll show you the changes we need to make to the Uma body unit profile. Um, next up, we are going to, under controller, enable use third-party movement controller. We are going to disable allow auto attack. The Invector um, controller is not going to work with auto attack. You'll need to click every attack. Um, and this is just um, due to some integration issues where you can't really cancel an attack once it started. So auto attack would just basically stick you in a loop where you could never do anything um, except for auto attack. Um, next, we're going to make sure we check use third party camera control. And then we'll pull in a reference to that third person camera right there. And that should be all that is necessary in order to actually load the game with the Invector um, unit. We just need to configure the UMA body. If we look at the existing UMA body unit profile, you can see we have the typical model and default character unit selected. We are actually going to remove the model from this, so we're going to click on None right here. And then instead of default character unit, we are going to drag in that reference to that new Invector unit, because with the Invector unit, the character is actually right on this base unit. It's not like a separate thing that you spawn, um, because Invector actually likes to rotate the entire unit, not just the model on top of the unit like we usually do. Now, Invector does have a footstep add-on, um, but if you don't want to use that footstep add-on, you can still use any RPG to do the footsteps. All we would need to do is in this UMA unit right here, let's just close down the animation props and the nameplate props, and we will click play on footstep under the movement section and change the audio profile to footstep hits and then we are going to save that head into basic free movement here and look for the run animation we're then going to go down to events and let's just open this up here move forward till our foot hits the ground and we're going to click on this to add a new event called play foot step. Then we're going to go over to the next foot step right here and add another event called play foot step. And you can do this for like four legged critters as well if you want them to sort of skitter around and make footstep sounds as they move. And that should be it. We should now be able to load the Lost Soul example game, and we should be able to basically just start playing with our Invector unit.
So if I go play a new game, you'll see that I don't get that new game character creator because I disabled it and basically just hard-coded the unit that I was going to start the game with. And because I am starting the game with the default unit, I should just launch into the game and play the Lost Soul game like usual with the standard music and opening cutscene and an Invector controlled character. And you can tell this is the Invector character because he is using the Invector stance here um, with his hands sort of at his side there and there's a little bit of foot sliding and of course you know I can do things like crouch which I can't normally do with the normal Invector controller. I think you may be able to hear the footsteps as well. Okay, and maybe not. I'm looking at Streamlabs right now. I can't tell if you can hear that. I know the background music might be drowning it out, but he is playing the footsteps whenever his feet hit the ground when he runs. And you can go ahead and, you know, play the game like usual. I'm going to jump into a different project now um, that's also using the Invector controller um, that is a little farther along, so you can see what this looks like um, with an Uma character that's, um, that's got a few more options on him such as armor and weapons and he's actually like finished the game and he can mount up and stuff um, just so I can demonstrate how those features are going to work as well. So we're just loading up my pre-made Invector test project here and let's go ahead and just launch the game. Oh, and you know what I need to do here? I need to actually switch this back into my standard layout here. I had the um, the game on the other window. Let's try that again. Now, you might notice the action bars are a little messed up um, just because I have them configured for a full screen right now, so don't be surprised if they kind of go off the screen a little bit. Um, let's go to load game, and I will load up my V Mage, which is an Invector controller or controlled mage. And you can see, you know, he's got like a skull staff on and um, the brown armor. Okay, here we go. And so you can see that basically we can run around. We can hear like these footstep echoes here. Um, I can zoom with the mouse and zoom in and zoom out. And I can roll by hitting the R key. Uh, that's something else you can't do with the built-in controller and you can only do with the Invector controller. If I hit T, I'm gonna basically go into um, into uh, strafe mode so you can see I'm sort of strafing sideways instead of basically running sideways and the character is essentially moving a lot slower when I back up he's actually backing up as opposed to the normal run where he'd actually sort of turn around and face the camera um, if I hit X I can sort of crouch down and I can move around while I'm crouching um, once again R is rolling so this is working pretty good and we can do spell casts and you know you can see the character casting and we can't actually move the mouse or the the camera while we're casting um, and that's part of the invector integration so we know that everything's working fine there and finally let's just check the um the settings here go to the sound settings maybe turn down the effect volume a little bit keep the voice volume up Turn the music down a little bit, perfect. And so we know that's working good. And let's have a look at the cutscene here and we can see that it properly pops you out of the, um, the, the current level the and it basically disables the Invector camera and the Invector character properly and it's switching over to the cutscene properly here and the characters are not spawned and so once this cutscene is complete then we will basically reload the level um, the NERPG engine will automatically re-enable the Invector
character controller at that point. And after it re-enables the controller and the camera, it will not attempt to use its own internal camera anymore. So this is working great. We can uh, just even cancel that a little early. And once we load back in, there we are again with our Invector controlled character. And we can do as many roly-polies as you want. If you've ever watched uh, Viva La Dirt League, these are the masters of the roly-poly with the Invector controller here. Um, let's go ahead and just take a look at some of the armor uh, that's included with the game. So. We'll pop out to the main menu and we'll go ahead and click on, oh, you know what we want to do? We want to make one minor change first. I think I'll actually do that in my demo game here. Um, click on use new game window again and press play and we'll have access to that new game window again. And then you can see all the sort of armor variations that are included with the engine as well. Click on new game and here we have uh, the channeler class and so let's go ahead and check out all the different specializations. We have a fire channeler so we've got some red robes and a red uh, gem in the staff. We've got an ice channeler who can wear these nice blue robes with the uh, blue gem in the staff. The lightning channeler who can wear yellow robes and a yellow staff. We have a necromancer with a sort of violet theme happening here and the wind channeler uh, with this sort of like a Cheyenne theme here. Um, if we go back to the character class, there's also the fighter class, which is just gonna wear like some pants and gloves and you know, he's tough, so he doesn't have any specializations uh, or a shirt. And if we choose the ranger class, we can see the rangers are going to get a bow for a weapon, um, and they have this gear. They do have some specializations, but the specializations don't affect their gear. We can also go to the warrior class, and we can see that basically under the specializations, we have the berserker, and he's going to wear some brown armor, and he's got a nice two-handed battle axe. We've got a blood knight who's wearing this sort of pink armor, and he's got like this uh, two-handed sword. We have a guardian with a sword and shield. He's like more the tank type with a nice gray tank armor. And then our lemon yellow paladin with his yellow hammer and his uh, bright paladin armor. So any RPG, this is the full Unity package, not the, uh, the GitHub version, but yeah, the full Unity package has a decent um, sort of selection of recolors. I especially like, um, let's go back to the channeler class here. I especially like the channeler recolors, especially like this ice channeler here. Why don't we go ahead and just start the game as an Ice Channeler Barbarian and we can see that sort of awesome armor there. And here we are using the Invector controller with our Ice Channeler Barbarian class guy. And the Guardian of Souls is now an enemy to us because we're the Barbarians. And you can see the Guardian of Souls is a real tough guy. He's going to wander over and like one shot us for a thousand damage. He's definitely a Guardian. Nobody is getting past him, that's for sure. And that is basically all of the new features in the NERPG 0.10 Alpha release. Once again, the Unity package can be downloaded from nerpg.org slash downloads, and there is a link um, on the same page to the GitHub repository with the NERPG core package and instructions for how to get that installed. So I certainly hope you enjoyed that. I had a lot of fun making it, and I've been looking forward to releasing this um, character creator and simplified uh, Invector setup for a while now, um, as well as the ability to easily add any character models you want and choose from different ones and preview the armor. So a lot of cool features. Um, if you like that, then don't forget to subscribe to the Any RPG YouTube channel and uh, give the video a thumbs up or a comment or share it out at anywhere you can. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next time.